Many millennia from now, we may have journeyed out to colonize billions and billions of planets in our galaxy, but every journey has to start somewhere. Today we will look at how near-term space colonization and development is shaping up and what the current hurdles to it are. I think that to have a realistic view, we need to see those hurdles for what they are and also see space for what it is. Those of us in the pro-space camp are sometimes prone to seeing space in the near-term with rose-colored glasses, because we know how awesome space in the long-term can be, worlds without end. And we'll cover many of those worlds later, after we cover some of the current hurdles to space, as we look at colonization orbit, on the moon, Mars, the asteroid belt, Venus, and Jupiter. Some topics are too big for the episode, so next week we'll look at living in space, to ask both what the hurdles are to living in space and what it might be like. Also, we'll be doing a poll at the end of today's episode on our YouTube community page to see which topic from today we'd most prefer to see get expanded into its own episode. The one undeniable thing about space is that it is big and there's always more to discuss. But in order to see a realistic path forward, we need to acknowledge some things space is not, or at least isn't for many generations. For instance, we often say we shouldn't keep all of our eggs in one basket, and need to put some eggs into some other baskets. That is, get humanity out to other worlds so we don't get wiped out. But while true, this is not really that much of a safeguard, If humanity wrecks Earth, there's no new planet to flee to. Even a previously M-class but now bombed out and nuked wreck of a planet is always going to be easier to fix than it would be to terraform some other world. Some little outpost of a hundred people on the moon isn't going to save humanity if our atmosphere gets ruined by pollution, or a supernova, or gamma ray burst, and dying stars as a large and proximate danger are an overhyped threat anyway. If we make some killer AI, it's just as capable of chasing down our colonies and just as likely to be formed on one, where the colonists lack the resources to control it as well, then come here for a visit. Indeed, realistically, our colonies and distant mutant children or cousins raised on alien planets far from Earth are a lot more likely to be threats to us than some natural catastrophe. More planets and more people mean more minds working to solve problems and more redundancy of civilization in general, but when settling new worlds, it is not an across-the-board miracle solution either. In the long term, it makes sense. On million year timelines you do have to worry about dangerous dying stars, or stellar remnants crossing our path, or dinosaur killer scale asteroids, but no threat of doom either near or on the horizon and of our own making is ever truly eliminated by us being spacefaring. Where humanity is concerned, we are our own biggest near term threat, and we export ourselves and our troublemaking Pandora's box opening ways to any colony we form. If we can't make ourselves walk over millions of years, or even just centuries, adding more planets to the mix isn't likely to be that big a game changer to our survivability. And even for those rare astronomical threats, having more planets is merely beneficial, not necessary. We probably do not need a huge space presence of hundreds of settlements to protect Earth from an incoming asteroid. You need a very impressive radar grid and tracking system, and some delivery system for the nuke, laser, or thrust module you would use to blow that asteroid up or redirect it. It is statistically improbable any asteroid of dangerous size, let alone an extinction scale one, would hit us in the next century, and odds are such a detection and deflection platform would be a lot better and cheaper by then. However, the big difference is that in a future where we have lots of space development, that asteroid isn't a potential cataclysm costing billions a year to monitor for and defend against, instead it's a jackpot for space developers. Free raw materials approaching Earth orbit to be used to fuel more construction and development there. This is generally going to be true of a lot of potential reasons for developing space, it's very handy to have but expensive to get and not necessarily worth the initial investment. For a bit of context, you don't tell early pioneers in the US to build a freeway along the Oregon Trail, 
big, long, continent-spanny, multi-lane paved roads like Route 90 or 20 come later, as did the railroads. Built too soon, and you would devastate the development effort with the high cost and bad reputation of being wasteful of investor funds or public money, as well as tying later funds up in marginal projects or those deemed too big to fail. One of the biggest problems with getting to space is the cost per flight, or per pound or kilogram gotten into orbit, and while that's come down a lot in this last decade, it is still high. It takes a lot of fuel to get to orbit, but ironically, as huge and costly as that is, it is only a small portion of the cost. Most of it is in the cost of building the rocket that fuel goes into, which historically has often been single use, and even reusable ones tend to need costly overhaul and maintenance far in excess of the fuel cost per trip, and have made far fewer trips between repair than a car or airplane do. If you built a Boeing 747 for a single flight and then scrapped it after every flight, and built a new 747 for the next flight, flying would be way too expensive. The same is true with rockets, historically we threw away the rocket after every flight because it was considered too bulky and complex to attempt a recovery. Even with the Space Shuttle, it was so expensive to get the recoverable parts back into working order after every flight, we couldn't save anything by refurbishing parts of the Space Shuttle and other parts like that big external tank just burned up in the atmosphere. Thankfully we seem to be getting close on the fully reusable rocket. For a long time this was considered a pipe dream. The mighty Saturn V, for example, managed to get something like 2.5% of its starting mass into LEO and went from a huge, 10 meter wide flying skyscraper down to a cramped, stripped to the bone two person pod in order to briefly land two people on the moon from which they had to quickly hurry off before their non-renewable supplies ran out. After the Saturn V rocket was scrapped, for a long time we moved on to even less efficient rockets, something Elon Musk in particular lamented about in his heyday and pointed to as a big reason why he helped form SpaceX. They've done a great job improving reusability, and the road forward to cheaper and more reusable rockets is definitely an uphill and bumpy one, but it does seem transversible, and who knows, perhaps in the future we will design and perfect a fully 3D printed reusable rocket with no assembly required. We are discussing capabilities for getting to space and having the energy, resources, and funding all vital to that but there's also the need for political and bureaucratic concerns. This isn't an easy hand wave either, for instance, we were just talking about rocket costs, and a lot of that is regulatory burdens, call it legitimate safety measures or bureaucratic red tape, and that can be pretty debatable and subjective depending on the specific rule and oversight, but it adds costs and time to everything and it isn't easily brushed aside, nor do we necessarily want to brush it aside. There's no clear bad guy or enemy or political faction to point at and blame for it either, or funny for space in general. By and large, space is very popular politically, and with the populace in general, even if individual programs might be more mixed. I don't think there's any major faction of any major government that wouldn't love to have a moon base if they could be offered one with a reasonable price tag and a reasonable certainty of it happening for that cost and timeline. Problem is, while I love NASA, their track record of keeping to budgets and timelines is, well, not one to brag about even by government standards. And speaking from anecdotal observation, they don't seem to be good at pitching space development projects as attractive in the same way they tend to be good at pitching telescopes. It does beg the question if NASA is really the optimal institution for space development, and this is something a lot of folks at NASA are dubious about too, from anecdotal experience. Space is huge, it's much bigger than Earth let alone any nation on Earth, and yet most nations use a large spectrum of departments or ministries to operate their country. We already see this happening with the American Space Force, the recognition that there is a need to approach space militarily and that NASA neither wants nor needs that role, and no existing branch of the military was ideally suited for it and thus it had to be created. Incidentally this doesn't imply any bad actors or someone to blame. When it comes to NASA, it isn't just the astronauts who have the right stuff. What happens is focus shifts back to the main goal of the body though. Put the Army in charge of the space program and we would tend to favor programs that gave us better space-based ground surveillance satellites. 
give the Air Force or Navy funds to develop a space plane and they are going to subconsciously move those funds towards hypersonic fighters or bomber craft, as opposed to space defense paradigms. It's institutional, and any of them are going to prefer a focus toward things like anti-satellite programs or asteroid defense over making rocket fuel or money in general. Give NASA $10 billion to make a moon base and they're going to set up a telescope there, which honestly has very little to do with profit and industry unless you make and sell telescopes. Private companies involved in this don't necessarily fix the problem either. The ones with huge resources able to handle space development are generally so big they have the same sort of risk averse behaviors government departments and governments in general have. That does have advantages, I don't think most of us truly want our main source of law, infrastructure, and industry to be prone to erratic and risky behavior, and they tend to have a known mission and stick to it with bloody minded stubbornness. And you probably need something like that when tackling mega projects like building a highway system or administering many types of policies to millions day in day out for decades. So one can make the case that what you need is the equivalent body of the Department of Commerce or Infrastructure or Transportation but for space, and eventually an agency for every space version of our groundside departments and ministries and bureaus. But not yet. Nobody wants 50 different space-centric agencies right now, and instead you just do what normally organically happens, make a blanket group that occasionally undergoes mitosis or spits out a sub-department that needs to be its own thing, like the Army did for the Army Air Corps back in the day to make the Air Force and later happened with the Space Force. We'll just call it the Space Development Agency for the moment but figure on this idea of getting more and more life in the next decade or so than ending up as a reality in the decade after that. If we, meaning the US, don't have one by 2050 I'd be shocked, unless it was specifically an international or multinational group, which has its own advantages and pitfalls of course. Note that I'm only talking about an agency with some real oomph, not a feel-good shell with no real resources, authority, or attraction to talent. Short on the heels of that, you will need to contemplate how we actually govern space settlements, and that doesn't necessarily translate to new countries. The idea of some colony of a thousand Martians under a dome being a sovereign nation is popular in sci-fi, but probably would not be the norm for successful colonies. Interstellar colonies need to be independent from day one, but that's further ahead. Settlements in this solar system have very little signal lag. Old school, messages traveled with people, so your colony several weeks away by foot, hoof, or ship really wasn't in much contact and often didn't benefit from that relationship or didn't feel they did. That dynamic is likely to be different in a digital age. A colony on even distant Pluto or in the Kuiper Belt is only 4-6 to six hours of signal time away, and prior to the last century that was the lag time for communicating with your nearest neighboring towns and we certainly had functional and centrally operated nations with bigger communication time lags than that during those eras. That's email time not phone time and it does mean you need some local executive or viceroy with emergency powers, but there's nothing stopping a colony on Pluto, let alone Mars or the asteroid belt, from simply being a state or even a county or township, which would fit in better with the population numbers. It's unlikely any universal model would apply, but while early colonies are likely to be under the direct administration of their main government, like Congress does for DC or smaller territories, it is also likely that as they become more numerous or common they would be looking to leave that mixed blessing behind in favor of being either part of some existing state or province or forming up with a handful of other colonies to either be a new state or province or a new small nation. Just as much as the air they need to make so they can breathe, a colony is going to need a smooth administrative and bureaucratic landscape. Citizens and business investors will want that, and existing governments can potentially provide that. You do not really have the manpower for your own Supreme Court or FBI or Treasury. We also don't necessarily want to encourage too much independence or isolationism in emerging colonies. As fond as I am of the American pioneer era, it certainly had its nastier moments, and a lot of those, and parallel examples of history, came from corrupt viceroys and thuggish local robber barons or ranchers who own half of everything and think they're above the law, or some outbreak of Salem witch trials or tin pot dictators who think they are the law and keep busts of Robespierre and Saint Just in their office, or some brutal religious cult whose leader seems to need dozens of teenage wives 
or a mining town whose workers are essentially used as a corporate asset and kept in ignorance and debt slavery. Homeworld bureaucrats and regulations can also make your life beyond difficult even without bringing war and embargo into play. In that regard, it might be more like radiation you manage as opposed to the air you breathe, but it's a vital part of a successful space colonization, and needs to be part of any space development plan. And I'm just guessing we want to build our own new nation is not a good opening line if you're looking for government funding. And while I think private space enterprises have an ever-growing role in space, and will reach a point where there'll be the majority of it sooner than not, that time is not here yet, and also isn't the same as total government involvement. You also need to be contemplating multinational situations and problems like who is actually entitled to grant you the right to mine an asteroid, or build a dome on the moon, or build some huge power collector or sunshade in orbit and visible to the naked eye by everyone down here. And that seems a good place to transition from horrors we'll encounter to places we'll go, as what we do in orbit of Earth is likely to dominate all our other space ventures for a long time. Longer than folks might think, too, as it's not just going to be the gateway to space once we have some settlements on other worlds, but probably the lion's share of space settlements and enterprises until the population in space exceeds that on Earth. And indeed it is likely to be the largest single chunk of the human population off Earth for millennia to come. That's not a neo-term concept and one we explored more in our episodes Cislunar and Lagrange Point Colonization, but in the near-term it's where most of your satellites are and virtually all your microgravity experiments or manufacturing and space hotels. And you might ask how much space colonization can really be supported on space hotels, but remember that in the US alone, as of 2023, there are almost 170,000 hotels and on any given day, on average, 9 million people staying in them. It's a multi-trillion dollar industry and one only likely to grow in a hopefully ever more prosperous society in the US and worldwide. Just as an example, if we got to the point where a trip to space might cost the equivalent of 10 to 20,000 modern dollars or euros, it would be very plausible that around 10% of the population would make the trip once in their lifetime and worldwide at current population lifetime that would be about 10 million people a year and 100 billion plus of annual revenue, that's hardly a tiny economic sector. But we may also see entire manufacturing chains move to low orbit. There are things you can do with crystal growth and microgravity that hold the potential to revolutionize computers or other material sciences, and that's a sector where the products are already far more costly than their weight in gold, and thus could be profitable even if you had to fly the materials up rather than source them from the moon or some asteroid. The critical component of orbital space development though is being able to get most of your bulk fuel and raw materials from some place other than Earth. That may rapidly change if we get some technology like mass drivers, orbital rings, space elevators, or tethered rings working. See our Upward Bound series for deep dives on each of those. If those work out though, it is likely to be cheaper to get things to orbit from Earth than from the lower gravity well of the moon or an asteroid, all of which are hundreds of thousands to hundreds of millions of miles away, not hundreds, as Earth is to low orbit. Devices like that seem inevitable to me, but they are inevitable the way railroads and freeways are, and may not emerge in the next century, though I'd love to be wrong about that and it changes everything if they become easy to build and the investment gets made. In the near term, to make space happen it would seem we need to find a way to get the bulk of our material off the moon, where a lack of air and low gravity makes that easier. A couple months back we delved into mining and refining on the moon in detail, but the critical idea is that even if we can't find water buried on the moon in ice or other formats, it has tons of metals and tons of oxygen which gets released when making those metals. Virtually every rocket fuel we use also uses oxygen to burn itself, and that's usually the majority of the mass involved, so even if you can't get water or hydrogen off the moon, you can instantly get most of your rocket's mass by filling it with oxygen you get from the moon, while turning local regolith into the bulk metals or silicon that you need for building orbital facilities, spaceships, domes, habitats, solar collectors, mirrors, or shades. That means you can carry molecular hydrogen or maybe methane into orbit and use that in your moon oxygen for running spaceships around orbital space or to other planets. 
We also have lots of non-rocket methods of moving around orbit, from ion drives to electrodynamic tethering or various runway style launch systems like orbital rings. Down the road you can get ice and hydrogen cheaply, if slowly, from the outer system, as we discussed in our recent episode on comet mining. So if you run out of moon ice or it doesn't have any, you can get it from Earth or other sources while still enjoying the huge savings in oxygen and bulk raw materials from the moon. Other substances like helium-3 might turn out to be useful too, though if you get an aneutronic fusion reactor working that uses helium-3, I think you rapidly shift to getting it from better sources in the outer system, see our episode Colonizing Neptune, and while it is valuable for other uses besides possible fusion, I'm not sure there's a big enough market for it or a big enough supply on the moon to make that a good industry, but every little bit matters for overall space development. That overall lunar development process probably needs to either be nuclear powered or as pilot solar projects as the sun sets on the moon for a couple weeks at a time. Longer term, the moon is likely to be mass producing all sorts of mirrors, shades, and power collectors for orbital use and can presumably use some of those for its own. In the meantime, this could be an industrial effort of literally millions of people involved in mining, refining, processing, manufacturing, and shipping all this raw material and they might live on the moon too, though we need to be mindful that at just over a light second away, the moon is a great candidate for robotics, remote control, telepresence, and limited AI. So it could be a future of thriving and heavily populated settlements on the moon, or it could be a relative handful of people who cycle in to repair robots, handle weird and unexpected problems, and make sure all is well. See our episode Lunar Space Elevators for more discussion of getting material off the moon once you refine it. Mars doesn't have that robot problem, in the remote or telepresent sense. Obviously the only thing we've ever sent to the Red Planet is robots, and the moon will probably hold the unique status of being the only body ever walked on by a human before some robot visited it. We can usefully control operations on Mars remotely, but it isn't easy with the signal lag. So we either need to get better AI, which we probably will, or send manned expeditions there. In the short term, much of what we do with Mars will be determined by the contents of our moon and the Red Planet's own two tiny little excuses for moons, Phobos and Deimos. If they are found to have ice on them, then our first voyage to Mars should be to those moons instead, to set up the fuel refining process we have mastered on our own moon. Barring that, we could still get oxygen there using those metal processing methods, and Mars itself definitely does have ice so getting hydrogen for our fuel is much easier if Phobos and Deimos lack it. We can also send fuel from the moon cheaper than from Earth. Being able to go to Mars in a big way, complete with setting up a radiation shielded base in one of those two moons, and deploying some communication satellites in orbit of Mars makes settlement of Mars from the outset much more plausible. This would help circumvent some long period between the first manned mission and actual settlement, like with the moon, and it has been over 50 years since we visited Luna. However, I am not optimistic about Mars being humanity's future. It has the ability to be colonized and terraformed, we've examined and discussed that in detail in other episodes like Colonizing Mars and Springtime on Mars. Nonetheless, it offers few reasons for anyone to migrate there. Mars is not going to be shipping anything of value home to Earth, or the Moon. I have difficulty seeing it ever being a net positive in trade, which means it would not be fast to develop beyond science outposts. Given time it would grow. It has no shortage of raw materials, but so do many other places with even less gravity. The classic sci-fi image of Mars as Earth's neo-equal and holding a higher status among humanity's space colonies just doesn't seem warranted, any more than thinking that McMurdo Station in Antarctica will one day rival the great cities or nations of other continents. Nonetheless, Mars fascinates us and will be colonized sooner than not, and I suspect we'll see dedicated tourists travel there on large and slow Aldrin cyclos within a decade or two of the space hotel industry in orbit reaching 1,000 or more annual tourists. Mars has a lot of attractions to visit, from the tallest mountains in all known creation to canyons so immense and long they make the Grand Canyon look like a ditch, but I can't see people rushing to make it their home or wanting to bring their spouse and kids.
The big advantage Mars has compared to the asteroids or moons of Jupiter, which we'll get to in a bit, is that you can do domes and feel real if diminished gravity and maybe turn the red planet blue, green, and white one day. However, when it comes to places we could terraform that way, Venus has the edge. We used to think that Venus was a paradise world till we found out those beautiful clouds on it were made of acid and the surface was hotter than an oven. Venus turned out not to be a place of paradise but more like a suburb of hell, and so it fell off the map and gave Mars prominence as Earth 2.0. But as we discussed in Winter on Venus, cooling and terraforming that planet isn't particularly more time consuming and difficult than Mars. Indeed it is probably much easier and offers a planet that is far more Earth-like. In the meantime, Venus offers lots of science options and tourism too. Hang gliding the blimp outposts of Venus is bound to be attractive to many tourists, and it's a shorter and faster trip to Venus than Mars. You wouldn't fall to your death if something went wrong either. Normal breathing air floats on Venus and your parachute could just be your air tank popping into a balloon to hover you till some drone came by to bring you back. Venus is also attractive for atmospheric mining, particularly of nitrogen which is rare in the inner system of Earth, but it means that it has an export of clear value, and it also has a hyperabundant power supply in the form of solar panels, which could easily be made into solar blimp balloons which instead float high in the atmosphere. Jupiter is another place we're interested in for atmospheric mining, and of a different variety, but we'll save that discussion for our episode on atmospheric mining next month, on September 21st, 2023. In the meantime our main interest in Jupiter is actually in its many moons and associated asteroids. Radiation near Jupiter is an issue, but most of our interest in those moons is deep down on them, as we think Europa and maybe Callisto have subsurface oceans and you only need maybe a meter of dirt or ice to shield you comfortably from the radiation around Jupiter. We don't need it for sunlight, Jupiter is far from the sun, so the surface matters little. But those moons have low gravity but are also rich in volatiles and water ice. The gravity on each of them is similar to our own moon. Time will tell if that's comfortable for humans or needs to be augmented with spin gravity habitats and the answer to that might determine if the moon is Earth's preeminent colony or a giant robotic factory. The same is true of the moons of Jupiter except that they are candidates for native life, and we will want to explore them. Should we find life there, or on Mars or anywhere else in the solar system, the dynamics for settlements shift a lot, lots of science to be done there, and also lots of concerns about damaging that ecosystem. To me, the first established trade line to the moons of Jupiter and the first settlement on those has always represented that stepping stone where we've gone from dreaming of space development to truly doing it. Space isn't just pilot programs, research, and distant future dreams, it has become a reality at this point, even if it is still very early days. The same applies to ventures to Saturn or its moon Titan, a critical threshold has definitely been reached by this stage. Indeed you could argue that threshold has been reached by the time you get to the asteroid belt, but that can be confusing with our penultimate topic for today, asteroids, as we often talk about them being vital to early space development, more so than Mars or Venus or maybe even the Moon, and while the belt has lots of them, there are thousands that qualify as near-Earth asteroids and which represent the best options for early asteroid usage. They are easier to reach for probes and mining efforts, many are small enough that they could be moved and turned into space habitats in high orbit of Earth or turned into Aldrin cyclers to the belt or other planets, allowing cheap and radiation proof slow boats to those places. Many could be outfitted with solar kilns and simple electromagnetic mass drivers or space guns to fire ingots of metal into Earth orbit for construction or use that momentum and oxygen byproduct to push themselves into a stable position at a Lagrange point or as an Aldrin cycler. Indeed if we needed to we could potentially shove one to the Earth-Sun L1 Lagrange point and detonate it to create a thin cloud blocking some of the light hitting Earth for a time, as a quick and dirty alternative to putting solar shades there. This to me represents the final big kickstarter for real space development, as these sorts of asteroids are, in a way, much easier to terraform than planets. 
Indeed, the term terraforming was coined in the sci-fi short story Collision Orbit by Jack Williamson in 1942 in reference to an asteroid someone was making livable with artificial gravity. We don't have sci-fi style artificial gravity, but we can produce it by spin, and it would be very easy to nest a spinning ring or cylinder habitat into a crater or mine shaft on an asteroid or comet and cover it over with a thin layer of regolith or ice to protect it from collisions or attack. These rotating habitats can have 24 hour days and normal Earth like lighting and gravity. In my mind, that makes them much more attractive to settlers who have ready made industry on that asteroid to fuel the economy, be it mining or space farming or being a space hotel or Aldrin Cycler or tending to a local collection of solar rafts, beaming power home, or to spaceships and facilities. Of course, space might get pretty crowded during development, especially in the orbit of Earth and if you're doing things like blowing up asteroids. This sets off the concern of space debris and our last topic for today, and one I suspect needs its own episode. It's also more tempting since I finally took audience advice and watched the anime Planetase which has some interesting explorations of space debris clearance. Space debris has the problem that in orbit any little bit of debris can hit something else and eject far more debris from that impact, which can cause a chain reaction up there without air slowing the debris down. This may be the pollution issue of the future, with vast efforts directed at limiting and controlling it, or it may be something like the smog that orbital habitats and ships just dwell in, with thicker armor, which many would need to have anyway to attract settlers. No one wants to live in something separated by the vacuum by a thin layer of tinfoil, give me battleship thick hulls instead. There are a lot of options for potentially handling space debris and we'll need to come up with some good ones before we can truly develop space, but this episode has already run long and I thought since we had a few topics that we had to discuss briefly but deserved more time, we would do a poll of those on our YouTube community tab page to vote on which of those subtopics we should do a focused episode on. Those are Clearing Space Debris, Near Earth Asteroid Development, Space Regulation, and Settling Mars, Phobos and Deimos. I think all of those might turn out to be very important to near-term space colonization, but you can collectively choose which topic we'll discuss next, and in the meantime, one nice thing about talking about near-term space colonization is that the front end of that wave is just years away now, not some distant idea of sci-fi. Our future is in space, and that future isn't that far off anymore. So before we get to our upcoming schedule, I wanted to give everyone an update on the New Horizons petition that we discussed two weeks back in Comet Mining. This is to save that spacecraft so it can keep properly exploring the Kuiper Belt out past Pluto, for the low cost of a few million more dollars rather than waiting decades to get another billion dollar probe out there. Rumor on the grapevine is that it is having the desired effect, so thank you everyone who signed it. I think we should keep the inertia up, So if you haven't signed the petition already, please help us save the New Horizons spacecraft by signing the petition linked in the episode description so it can keep helping us explore New Horizons. Once we explore New Horizons it will be time to settle them and so next week we'll be continuing today's topic with the discussion of living in space, and the week after that the topic of interplanetary infrastructure. After that it will be time for Sci-Fi Sunday again on September 17th to celebrate SFIA's 9th birthday with the Fermi Paradox, Fallen Empires. Then on the 21st we'll talk about how we can mine atmospheres, like those on Venus or Titan, or even gas giants and stars. We'll close out the month with a livestream Q&A on Sunday, September 24th, and then on the 28th we'll have an exploration of what traveling the galaxy as an adventurer or lone wanderer will be like in Have Spacesuit, Will Travel. If you're impatient for that next episode, you can get caught up on recent episodes like Comet Mining and get all the details on why Saving New Horizons matters. And don't forget to vote in our poll today to see what topics of near-term space colonization we should make episodes about in the future. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula, along with hours of bonus content at go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. 
As always, thanks for watching and have a great week.